met the man on the road to Philippi. He began to talk to you about his journey all over the Mediterranean. He had said his name was Paul, and he was traveling about sharing what he kept calling the good news. I mean, you had known this phrase, you were familiar with it, uh, being a Roman centurion after all, you know that various conquered peoples and cities all over the known world had proclaimed this good news to them. It was good news that Caesar was now in charge. Good news. Good news. Good news. But Paul seemed to think that this Jesus guy from this small town in podunk nowhere was a greater king than Caesar. He explained it in much more detail and was quite versed and articulate, actually. It, it, it took you back a quite a number of times as you gazed into his old eyes and you saw the boundaries of human distinction fade away. No longer within this man was there Greek or Jew or Hellenist or whatever. There was the Christ. And the Christ was in all. Uh, greatly intrigued by the kind of trouble that this old man was stirring up, you thought it best to tag along on his next journey. His next journey to Thessaloniki. Bible Lots, thanks for exploring Paul's letters to the Thessalonians with us today. The past several episodes have introduced us to one major problem that the early church faced time and time again. Disunity among believers. Well, today's episode will introduce us to a second major theme that will weave its way into the following episodes. Disunity among non-believers. Which is really just a pithy way of saying persecution. You see, Paul's letters to the Thessalonians address basically two things. Persecution and the second coming of the Messiah. Which is really to say that the letters to the Thessalonians address one thing. It's how to have hope in the midst of dire affliction. And it's great that we get to see Paul's take on this because it really helps set up how to read John's revelation at the end of the Bible. For now, let's travel back to about the spring of 50 AD when a band of traveling missionaries named Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke arrive in the bustling aristocratic town of Thessaloniki, or Thessalonica. In Paul's day, the city was Roman-occupied, and when Paul and his contemporaries began to preach the message that Caesar had been overthrown to make way for the new king, some Jewish god who required that they not worship other gods, well... The Gentile authority there is pretty upset. <laughs> the team is actually attacked so vehemently, so zealously from this opposition that they are driven out to Berea, which is just west of Thessaloniki, where the company finds good arms to rest in. But then, several days later, these angry men from Thessaloniki follow the team of missionaries to Berea, and so they rush Paul off by night and he escapes to Athens. Later, Silas and Timothy follow along, Luke leaves. A few months after this kind of tantalizing ordeal, Paul writes the letters to Thessalonica. You know, scholars believe that these letters may have been the first letters to have ever been written by Paul. Galatians may have been first, but we don't really know. And he wrote them from the port city of Corinth, where Paul stayed for a good deal of time. He only stayed in Ephesus longer, actually. You can imagine that the Christians that are left in the wake of Paul leaving Thessalonica have quite the task set out for them. I mean, they must feel compelled to tell others about this good news that they've received, the forgiveness of their sins and the reconciliation of God to man. But when they do so, they're beaten or killed or their children are kidnapped. And they are. The Thessalonian church is facing dire persecution. When Paul hears about their current condition and the current state of affairs in Thessaloniki, he pens these two letters to them. They're meant to inspire hope to a dying people. 
They're meant to reassure them that their belief in this Jesus is not in vain. They are meant to remind them of the good news that they heard when Paul was there, that Paul preached to them. This sentiment is made clear right off the bat when Paul starts off chapter 1 of the first letter to the Thessalonians by saying, We, meaning him and his contemporaries, always thank God for all of you, meaning the Thessalonians. Because, Paul says, the word of the Lord rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has been preached. He says, because you have turned to God from your idols to serve the living and true God, and you wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, you know, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. The point is clear. Paul himself feels blessed because the Thessalonians have not abandoned their faith in the midst of what we can only assume is this violent and tumultuous persecution. It's this steadfastness, Paul says, that becomes a blessing to them. Because the people of the known world have become so inspired by this faith. Remember, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but everywhere that they've preached. People have been so inspired by the faith of the Thessalonians that they themselves are also turning to believe in the living God of Abraham and not to the dead gods of their idols that the Romans worship. You also have to imagine that this persecution would lead to real and deep doubts that the faith that they had in this Jesus character is not at all true. It, just think about the social climate of the ancient world. Well, actually, it's not all that different from the spiritual climate of the 21st century in Western thought, but it's this idea that when you are on the right path, when you are doing good things, good things happen to you. The ancient thought was something like this prosperity gospel, or it was like karma, or it was like <laughs> the secret, where if you tune your mind to the right things of the universe, then good things will happen to you. You will get healthier, you will get wealthier, and you will be happier. So you can imagine when the Thessalonians essentially abandon everything and everyone they know and love for the sake of this good news of the reconciliation of God to man, you can imagine how shocking it must have been to be met with such strong opposition. But then again, Jesus' message was always different. And Paul reassures them of this, and he exhorts them to continue being blameless, continue holding fast to the faith that they heard when Paul was with them. You see, Paul notes that even though they find themselves in these awful circumstances that they do, God's will for their life has stayed the same, that they be sanctified. Which, put another way, is saying that God's will for their life is that they have this close, intimate relationship to God even though the outcome goes against what their contemporaries would preach, this health, wealth, and happiness idea. And remember, Paul says, that the man they worship, the king, the Christ, was also persecuted unto death, but he was raised from the dead. Paul reminds them that even those that they love will be raised with Christ as they will if they ever come to such an end. Therefore, because God wants to be with them in life and in death, they should continue all the more steadfastly in hope and in faith until Christ returns. You see, Paul doesn't tell them that they should give up. Paul doesn't tell them that they should pray for new circumstances. Paul tells them that they are doing exactly what they should be doing and that they should continue all the more. Then, Paul closes out 1 Thessalonians with these infamously confusing words. About the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you don't need anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. Now, it was generally understood in Paul's day. And from my understanding in some Jewish circles, it's understood like this today as well. That because uh, there's passages in prophets like Isaiah and other Old Testament prophetic voices that seem to give some sort of contradicting account to the work of the Messiah, uh, 
that there would be these two men to come and accomplish what God had set out since the beginning of time. The first Messiah would be this suffering servant. He would turn the hearts of many to the Lord through kindness and love. While this second Messiah would come and be this great military conqueror, overthrowing giant empires and turning the hearts of these pagan Gentiles to the Lord through submission. Paul and the other disciples of Jesus undoubtedly saw both of these things being fulfilled in one person, Jesus of Nazareth. Now here's the thing. We're not going to take time here to dissect the passage that's found at the end of the letter to the Thessalonians. If you'd like to do your own research on it, you can. Perhaps one day I'll even write a book on this subject. But be rest assured, there's an even more complicated passage in the second letter that we'll take a close look at, and they're very similar. So hang on to your seats. This passage from Paul's first letter to the church in Thessaloniki is so infamously confusing, actually, that when the Thessalonians themselves read it, they were confused. <laughs> in fact, they had misread it so much that they believed that the second coming had already happened and that they missed it. So the Thessalonians, they begin to freak out. Some begin to question their faith. Some begin to quit their jobs. Some even go into hiding. <laughs> So Paul writes a short letter back to the church in Thessalonica uh, to reassure them, to actually assure them that they had not missed the second coming of the Messiah and that they had simply misunderstood Paul. He starts the second letter to the Thessalonians by commending them for not having apostatized, even though they believed that Jesus had already come back for the faithful of the earth. He thinks that their steadfastness under persecution is again something to be admired greatly among many churches. He said that in the first letter as well. Paul then moves on to make clear that the persecution they still face is not the Lord's judgment for believing in Jesus as the Messiah. That just because the Roman authorities judge and oppose them does not mean that they are living in the time of judgment after Jesus' return, which is what they had come to believe. Then Paul goes on to write about the signs that they should look for at Jesus' second coming, which is exactly what we will take an in-depth look at, at the end of this episode. For now, know that Paul assures them that the day of the Lord has not come because of two main points. The great rebellion has not occurred, Paul says, and the man of lawlessness is still a mystery to humanity. Once those two things happen, the great rebellion and the revealing of this man of lawlessness, then the day of the Lord will come. Paul then closes out the second letter to the Thessalonians by encouraging them to stand firm in the faith and not be idle in their work. You know, we don't know why the Thessalonians are all quitting their jobs. We can assume. But Paul says that work helps them stay out of trouble. It helps them be generous with their wealth. And it helps them to reflect God's ideal for the kingdom of God as set out in the Garden of Eden. So he encourages them and exhorts them to continue working even when they don't think it's necessary or particularly like it and when they're being persecuted. And then, the letters to the church in Thessalonica fade out. I think you can see something of the Philippian church in Thessalonica. Which is kind of cool because they're so close to each other that maybe they were set up to encourage one another. I don't know. But remember, the church members in Philippi remained united to one another through disagreements and discord. And Paul encourages them for that. He says that their faith was a blessing because they remained humble through their disagreements. The church in Thessaloniki also remained unified but in the midst of this really hard persecution. It's likely that weekly or even daily, the church members would have known someone close to them who would have been killed or imprisoned for their boldness to share the gospel with other Roman citizens of the city. But their willingness to continue sharing their faith and helping the poor and loving their enemies became this testament to other Christians all around the Mediterranean, Paul says. And so what we see here, thematically, within the narrative, is this departure from Paul speaking about disunity and then the theme of remaining steadfast to the faith and unity become grafted into the narrative. And soon, these two themes will become the main characters of a single letter, even to the point of closing out the whole Bible. 
So, as we reach back into our hearts and our minds and examine these later letters from the perspective that we've been discussing this entire year, you know, I think one major characteristic of the snake crusher really comes out in the church in Thessaloniki. And that is that in order for the church to be the body of the snake crusher, in the act of crushing the snake, we need to be willing, or God allows us to be willing, or God even makes us willing, to say, thy will be done over our own will. Now, I, I think that we've made this kind of a cute add-on to our daily prayer rhythm, but I actually think that denying our own will and accepting the will of God is one of the hardest things for a Christian to do. To many of us, when we think of accepting the will of God, I, I mean, we think like the Corinthians, that when we do so, when we accept the will of God, we're going to be peaceful, we're going to be joyful, maybe even more wealthy. But in reality, oftentimes accepting the will of God in our lives means putting to death that which writhes in our hearts and in our minds, that which actively seeks to destroy us. So in one sense, accepting the will of God in our lives may look like taking a menial job because it's an opportunity to share the gospel. It may even look like not marrying anybody because God needs us to have a certain level of devotion to do his work, despite decades of hoping in a spouse. It may even look like failure. It may lead to death. All of this and more was the lot for our king. And so why should we expect any better? Now, the beautiful thing about forgiveness is that God will use us even when we get married despite him telling us not to. God will use us to advance the gospel even when we take the job that God told us not to take. You cannot get out from under the will of God, which is to glorify him. But at some point, we all have to come to this cross-section in our lives where we choose whether or not God is worth following, knowing that he will not give us everything we ever hoped for in this life. And hopefully, though I know that there are many answers to this question out there, hopefully we do choose to come under his authority because, as the prophets of old remind us, it is there where we find refuge from the coming judgment. And this is really what the heart of the Thessalonians is about. That's what Paul is tapping into when he talks about this man of lawlessness in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. This is that infamous passage we were talking about earlier. So let's just read it now. Remember, he's writing about the second coming in the midst of persecution to the Thessalonians. He writes this, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled, either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter, supposedly from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and then the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or object of worship, so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you about all of this? And you know what currently restrains him so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's work with every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders, serving the lie. And with every wicked deception among those who are perishing, they perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie, so that all will be condemned. Those who did not believe the truth but delighted in unrighteousness. So that was 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12 in the CSB translation. You can hear why this passage would be so comforting to a people afflicted by a strong government hand. 
because the passage speaks about how strong hands of government will be destroyed by the true king of the cosmos. But you can hear why this passage may have caused so much disruption over the past two centuries for church historians. But that's okay. Remember, it's good that the Bible is confusing for us because it means that it speaks to many different people in many different times and many different ways. And Paul is, in a sense, writing apocalyptic literature. He's writing prophetic literature, which, as we've talked about, is often difficult to read. And it's often difficult because it can quickly refer to two things at once. And so we need to read it with our double minds. Remember? There's usually some sort of current event that it's referring to, which is often socio-political. And there's often a spiritual reality that it's referring to as well, often a future reality. Now, as with the prophetic literature of the Old Testament, we can't say with 100% certainty what this means until it's revealed to us, as Jesus himself couldn't tell the times that these things would take place. And oftentimes, God reveals things to people that don't unfold as expected anyway. Remember, he is the God of the unexpected. But Paul is pulling language from Daniel and Isaiah, which is awesome, a huge clue, because we can look to those two books to understand or get a glimpse of what he's saying. You see, this man of lawlessness appears in the books of Daniel and Isaiah, and so does this great apostasy. And while we can't say it with certainty, we can say what it likely refers to. And that's this idea that government kingdoms, earthly governments, seem to get progressively worse throughout human history. They progressively act in rebellion against God's will. Paul seems to think that eventually this will all culminate in some ultimate form of corrupt power that Jesus will then destroy. And we can even think of this cyclically. I, I mean, look at Rome. That's what was plaguing the Thessalonians, and that was brought crashing down. Look at the German Empire. Look at the Assyrians. Look at what's happening in the world today. Human systems are corrupt because they're run by humans, and God destroys these systems because he is the ultimate true king that has ultimate authority over creation. So here's the thing. If the church is truly willing to look at the hard things that God has for them and still with love and passion say, thy will be done and not our own, then we have a governing body that will be glorified when all things are made new. In other words, Paul believes wholeheartedly that this coming of Christ and this destruction of the lawless one is good news for two huge reasons. Even though things are really, really bad wherever you are, whenever you are, they will always get worse. That's good. Because they get worse, it brings us closer to the followers of Christ being vindicated. It brings the followers of Christ closer to being reconciled and forgiven in glory and in fullness. And secondly, this is very good news because it means that if you find yourself as a person who has been actively and willingly trying to thwart the plans of God, and you find yourself wanting to be reconciled to God and not reconciled to this man of lawlessness, then God is always just and faithful to forgive, Paul reminds us. And he's calling you into his kingdom. He's calling you under his authority. He's calling you to pray, My Father in heaven, thy will be done, and not my own. Just as Jesus did in a cold garden one lonely night. Thanks so much. This was Bible Unbound. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.